I appreciate Alex giving me an opportunity to speak this morning as we launch this uh, campaign, Who's Your One? <clears throat> now, I haven't preached for a while, so I got a lot of sermons backed up. So just put up your watch and get out your calendar. That's what the famous preacher R.G. Lee from Memphis, Tennessee said one night, and he went on to preach for an hour and a half. Well, I won't preach for an hour and a half. Praise the Lord. First amen, I hadn't even got started yet. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to the book of Acts, the first chapter, verse 8. Jesus told his disciples, I want you to stay in Jerusalem. Stay in Jerusalem for the promise. Stay in Jerusalem until the promise of the Holy Spirit comes. And he said in verse 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remote part of the earth. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that it is just as true, just as applicable, just as vibrant today as it was in the day that it was written. May your word come alive in our hearts today, convict us, encourage us, inspire us, and may you bless your word, Father, and bless those who hear, bless your messenger, and may you be glorified. And when we leave this place, we can say it's been good to be in the house of the Lord, because we have seen the Lord. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> I was standing in Walmart a few weeks ago in line, and I struck up a conversation with a gentleman behind me. When I got ready to check out, he said to me, he said, do you have a computer? I said, yes. He said, are you online? And I said, yes. And I thought, well, I, I'm not joining Amway. And uh, <clears throat> he said, well, take this card. Take this card and go to the website on this card. And you will find there at that website, it will answer some of the most important questions in the world some of the most important questions that you need to know. And I took the card and I read it and it said, learn more about the Bible. Happy are those conscious of the spiritual need, Matthew 5, 3. On the other side, it says jw.org. That's the website, Jehovah's Witnesses. <clears throat> I put the card back in my pocket. And regardless of whether we agree or believe with the Jehovah's Witnesses or not, I think you will agree with me. Look how easy it was for this gentleman to share with me his faith and to share with me how, e how easy it was for him to share the gospel of the Jehovah's Witnesses. This is an easy way that we as Southern Baptists, as Christians, can share the gospel a non-threatening, polite, and friendly way to tell people about Jesus. The North American Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Con Convention has a new strategy, a new plan, a new way for us to share our faith, the gospel. It's not a new plan. It's been around since the first century of when there were Christians and when Jesus challenged his Christians, not only challenged them, but commanded them and commissioned them in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The commission is for Christians, for disciples. Disciples are those who are followers of Jesus, learners of Jesus, who put his uh, teaching into practice and in word and deed are sharing his gospel. Each one of us at, at Cano Baptist Church here is called to be faithful, be obedient, and be responsible in carrying out that great commission. The way the North American Mission Board 
that used to be called the Home Mission Board, wants us to think about Matthew 28 and the approach of carrying out the Great Commission in a different way. And I think it's an excellent strategy. Though the strategy itself is not important as our heart's desire to reach people is important. It's a plan that is fun and that it will work and that all can support it regardless of our age or ability. Here's the plan. Alex and Michael and myself have been praying about this plan and the deacons support it also. It is a plan that can help grow our church. The plan is called, Who's Your One? Who is your one? The North American Mission Board calls for this plan to be a 30-day emphasis. But the staff and I believe that it should be a way of life. Not just for 30 days, but lifelong for us as Christians and also in the life of our church. So in this coming year, the challenge is before us, each one of us to intentionally, with purpose and passion and commitment to ask God to lead us to one person, not 10, not five, not three, not two, but just one person, that God would lead us to one person to share the gospel with, to take our Bible and to show them how to come to know Jesus and share with them the plan of salvation that they might know Christ, come to know him as their Lord and personal Savior, come into our church, be baptized, and become a part of our church family. Just one person. Or you may bring them to church. You may have them on your heart. You've been praying for them. You've been talking with them. And you bring them to church. You take them to your Sunday school class. You sit beside them. You bring them to worship. You sit with them because that way they will know somebody. And then the Holy Spirit has a chance to convict them, to encourage them to come to know Jesus as their personal Savior. And it may be that you just have time and you have the opportunity to invite someone to church. You give them a track, you give them some of the literature that we're going to be providing in the coming weeks, and you just invite them to come to church to be here. You call them, you text them, you email them, whatever, and you build a relationship with them. A relationship on, built on friendship and love and concern for them and being willing to help them in any way that you can. And through your kindness, they will come to know Christ and come to our church. And that is the Who's Your One plan. Now, it has many benefits to share this plan with people. For one, they're born again. They won't go to hell. They'll get to go to heaven with the rest of the Christians or the rest of God's family. What a great benefit. It will grow our faith. It will grow our, and we will grow in faith and grow in boldness as we share with people. And we will grow our church family, the body of Christ, right here. It could extend the life of our church for years. Do you know that over 4,000 churches close their doors every year? 4,000 churches go out of business. That's 333 churches per month, 11 churches per day. And by the time that we began uh, Bible study this morning at 10 o'clock, and by the time we get out at 12 o'clock, one more church has closed its door. One more church has turned off its lights. There's no more preaching. There's no more praising God. There's no more invitations. There's no more prayers being lifted up for the sick and the lost. There's no more ba baby dedications. There's no more weddings. There's no more witness from that church in the community. I don't want to be a part of that statistic. Do you? Johnny Hunt is the former Southern Baptist Convention president who is now a senior vice president of evangelism and leadership of the North American Mission Board. At a recent Southern Baptist Convention annual meeting, he spoke concerning the Who's Your One campaign. And he said, if 10% of church attenders of the Southern Baptist Convention, just 10% of the 37 million Baptists that we are, if only 10% of them would go out and witness and bring one person to Christ, one person to come into the church, he said it would, for Southern Baptists, would be a record 
of the highest number of baptisms in the history of the Southern Baptist Convention. And we are 174 years old. Let me ask you, what is Kano Baptist Church took to heart? Took seriously who's your one emphasis? This campaign, this plan, this spiritual discipline of reaching out to other people, the unchurched people, what if we took it seriously and committed ourselves to pray and ask God, just bring me one person. Just help me to find one person. Lead me to one person through my daily activities that I might share Christ with, that I might bring into this church, that they might know Christ, be baptized, and join our church. What if we took that seriously and each one of us was committed to that purpose? What would happen? Well, there's approximately 30 people here today. How many would we have in a year? 60 people. 60 people would extend the life of this church. We disciple them, and then those 60 people go out and do the same thing that we did the year before. Look how we could grow. Look at the possibilities that God could do through us if we took the Great Commission if we took he, Who's Your One campaign seriously. As we think about this Who's Your One campaign and this plan, I want to remind us that we've been given a commission. Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save the lost. Lost people were Jesus' emphasis. That was his heart's desire to see lost people come to know the Lord and to follow him. The church's emphasis should be lost people. Not making Christian people comfortable and not just being here for fellowship and meeting our own needs, but the needs of others, especially those without Christ. To his disciples, Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. Go and make disciples. You shall be my witnesses. He's given us a commission. He's given us a message. The word church in the original language means ecclesia, which, is, which means called out. So the church are the called out ones, called out for a special purpose to do God's work. As Vance Havner says, we have been called out of this world to go back into the world, to call others out of the world, and that's all the business we've got in this world. If that was our heart's desire, we'd see our church changed. I was thinking today as I was walking my dog Falco about 7 o'clock this morning that the early church, their life evolved around Jesus. Their life evolved around prayer. Their life evolved around the church instead of making a living. I'm sure that they had to make a living, but it doesn't say that, that they were complaining about the weather. It doesn't say that Matthew was complaining because he couldn't collect all of the taxes he needed to collect. It doesn't say that Peter was said, well, it's going to be a bad day for fishing. Didn't catch anything last night. I doubt it if we catch anything today. It didn't say that John said, well, I, I didn't sleep well last night. I don't think I can attend the prayer meeting today, boys. No, their life was evolved around Jesus coming to know him and to follow him. The world needs the church. The world needs the church's message. I bring you good news of great joy is what the angels said to the shepherds on the hill. I bring you good news. Good news that in the city of David, of Bethlehem, today a Savior is born. The Savior of the world that will take away the sins of the world. He also said to them, do not be afraid. God is constantly telling us in his word, do not be afraid. The, the woman at the tomb, Jesus said, do not be afraid. The disciples in the boat when there was a storm, Jesus said, do not be afraid. And there's lots of things in this world to be afraid of. This is an unsafe place to live, this world. When you can get shot in your own home by a drive-by shooter, shooter like the little five-year-old boy did a few weeks ago. This place is not safe. But we don't have to live in fear. 
because God said, do not be afraid. It seems like there is conflict and unrest and many problems in every area of our society, every part of our country. From the cradle to the grave, it is broken and corrupt and damaged because of sin. This world needs Jesus. This world needs salvation. And no one can share the good news like the church. It's no one else's responsibility. Not the PTO, not the fire department, not any club or organization or sports team or Google or Hollywood. None of them can share the gospel like the church can. And none of them have the message of hope that Jesus has given us. He said, I have come that I might have life and life more abundantly. <laughs> we got the greatest message in the world. And we keep it to ourselves too often. The church's purpose is not to sit back and say, gosh, ain't it awful. The world is such a mess. Ain't it awful. No. We are to be the sight, the salt, and the light in the community and telling the world, but God demonstrated his love toward us. God demonstrated his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Died on a tree on Calvary that we might not be separated from God, but that we might be with him for eternity because he loves us and wants to forgive us. We've been given a biblical and example of ministry and outreach. You remember the story of the feeding of the 5,000. You remember it was getting late in the evening and the disciples looked around at that big crowd of people and said, where in the world are we going to get enough food to feed these people? Said 200 denarii of money is not enough to feed these people. Jesus said, go look. See what you have. And they said, well, here's a boy who's got two fish and five loaves. But I'm sure they were thinking, but what is so little among so many? And they had forgotten that just a little can be so much divided and multiplied. And a miracle done with so little can become so much in the hands of God. And the disciples had forgotten all about that. And they would not believe. Virginia Knott is not here with us today because she said, I just can't take the heat. So I said, that's okay. But I, want to, but I asked Virginia, could I share this story about her? A few years ago, she lived beside Nancy and Herman Cruz. And she says, I can't talk very loud, and I couldn't yell at Nancy across, her, across the yard there. But I began to wave at her every day. And I'm sure she waved at Herman also. She eventually had Nancy to come over and do some chores for her, and she got to know Nancy. And she befriended Nancy and Herman Cruz. And she invited them to church. And eventually, the Lord led them to become a part of this church family. And it all started with a wave, an act of kindness and love. Every one of us in here can do that. Every one of us can wave. Every one of us can be kind and reach out to the, our neighbor, reach out to a stranger, Reach out to someone, kind to someone today, whether it's at the gas pump or the supermarket or where, at the restaurant, wherever you go, you be polite, you be friendly, you be kind, and you see if some of them aren't surprised. Because people don't want to take the time to be kind, to share their life, to uplift people. But it can start a friendship that can lead to us sharing our love about Jesus Christ and can result in them coming to know Christ as their Savior and come into the church. You remember Lydia in, that, in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts where uh, Alex has been preaching? In the book of Acts, she was called a God-fearer. She was probably a, gen she was a Gentile, of course, and she had become a believer she called a God fear. She was one of the first people to be converted in Philippi and the first person that was named, which was very significant. And Paul came there, and no doubt he sat down with this 
group of people who were already meeting for prayer, and he began to teach them. No doubt he began to give Lydia some theological and pastoral training. And so when he left to go to another area to establish another church and to meet with other Christians, it is said by some biblical scholars that she is most likely the person to have led and cared for the first congregation in Philippi. She must have been the first pastor or the first assistant pastor anyway. We don't want to say that among some Baptists. But Lydia did a great service to Apostle Paul and to the Christian church by being a leader and opening up her heart, opening up her life, opening up her home for prayer. And it became a church that we still preach about today. You can share how God has blessed you. How God, how you have met Jesus Christ, how God has worked miracles in your life and how he has helped you through struggles, through pain and through sorrow. That other people need to hear your testimony and how God has helped you and blessed you because it will bless them and encourage them to come to know the God that you love through Christ. Ask God to help you to meet new people. We Christians run in the same circles and we spend time with the same people all the time most of the time, and that's Christian people. We need to ask God to help us to be bold, as Alex said this morning, to be more courageous and to step out and ask God to help me meet new people, people that don't know Christ. I tell you, there is fruit that is ready for picking. Now, there's some people that we need to uh, uh, shake the dust off our, off our shoes and go on our way because they don't care what we've got to say. So don't spend your time with that person. Look for the people that God is leading you to that want to know Jesus, that have a big hole in their life and their heart because their life is so broken, they need to know the forgiveness and the love of God through Christ. And those are the persons that we have the best chance of bringing into the church to know Christ. So look for that person and pray that God will lead you to that person. All of us have places of hobbies, places we like to go and eat, places we like to go for entertainment. We got friends that have friends. Then you begin to mingle with those friends and begin to look for the person that God is leading us to that we might share Christ. And who's your one just may be in that group. We've been given a mission, a message, an example of ministry and outreach, and we've been given the supernatural ability to carry out the Great Commission and also to be a part of Who's Your One. We can do this. We can be effective. Ordinary people can do extraordinary things or be a part of God's extraordinary miracles. We can be an influence into unchurched people's lives under the power and the leadership of God we can be a part of a growing church. In Acts 1, Jesus told the apostles to wait there for the Holy Spirit to fill their lives. The Holy Spirit did fill their lives. They devoted themselves to prayer and to meeting together and worshiping. In Acts 2, 3, 8, we see that Peter preached and thousands of people were saved and the Holy Spirit filled their life. And once again, they were devoted to prayer the disciples became powerful witnesses, and it's evident even the religious leaders and people who were not impressed by them could say about them, these people, even though they're unlearned, uneducated people, they don't have any theological training, but it's evident that they have been with Jesus. That's what people need to see when they see you and me, that we have been with Jesus. That will impress them most in the way that we live and the way that we treat them. Having been with Jesus, they learned, they followed, they obey, and they kept the word of God. Jesus said, those who love me, my disciples, will keep the word of God. The authorities persecuted Peter and John and the rest of the disciples, throwed them in jail, told them, don't preach in the name of this Jesus anymore. And what did they say? They said, we can't help. We can't help but speak and share what we have seen 
and what we have heard. They said, you start preaching again, we're going to throw you in jail. <laughs> and what do the disciples do? They go to a prayer meeting and they pray for God to give them the courage to do what they've already been thrown in jail for. And they begin to pray. And it says in verse 29, And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that thy bondservants may speak thy word with all the confidence. Will thou dost extend the hand to heal? And signs and wonders take place through the name of the Lord's servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. What is missing in the life of a Christian? What is missing in the life of a church that isn't experiencing miracles? that God is not using. What is missing in that Christian's life? What is missing in that church, in the life of that church? I want you to turn back to, think back to the feeding of the 5,000 in, in Mark 6. In Mark 6, we will see, we will see why miracles aren't happening in the life of Christians as we look at Mark Six. And let us read verses 35 through 38. And when it was already quite late, his disciples came up to him and began saying, The place is desolate and it is already quite late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and spend 200 denarii of bread and give them something to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go look. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. You know the rest of the story. And God worked a miracle. But he didn't work a miracle in the disciples' life because they were negative. Because they looked at the problem instead of the solution. They didn't even want to be a part of the solution. They wanted to send these hungry people away. They didn't even look to Jesus. They looked at the problem. And they did not have faith enough to say, maybe God can do something. Maybe Jesus can work a miracle like he did with, the, the, with uh, turning the water into wine. Maybe he can work a miracle like he did when he made the lame walk and the blind to see and heal the man with leprosy. They didn't think about that. They thought about the problems. They thought about the negative part. And they looked at that little fish and little bread and no doubt they thought to themselves, what in the world is this little <laughs> compared with such a need? They weren't willing to be involved in these people's lives. They weren't willing to be a part of God's miracles. Are you willing to be a part of the miracles that God wants to work? Through His great commission and through this plan, who's your one? It will work if we will work the plan, if we will believe and trust God. When you're willing to put your hand in God's hands, <laughs> great things can happen. When you make yourself available. To quote my favorite preacher once again, Vince Havner, he said, God will use you according to your availability. God will use you according to how available and willing you are to be used. I want to, you, I want to close with one more illustration concerning one of our own church people. Hugh Phillips passed away and went to be with the Lord two or three years ago. Now, I don't have all the facts. I just got what a few people have told me, and maybe some of you can verify this to be true or not. But it is said of Hugh Phillips that he had a Bible study in his own home for several years. It could have been 10, could have been 20, could have been more years. He had a Bible study faithfully. And no telling how many people's lives he touched through that Bible study. And it is one story connected with him and his Bible study that one young man was coming to the Bible study 
who had an addiction problem with drugs. And the young man was concerned one day that he was getting nervous, he was getting agitated, he felt that he had a craving to take drugs, but he did not want to be back on drugs. He wanted to be free. And he came to Hugh's house, and he asked him to pray for him. And Hugh, almost 89, uh, 90 years old, fell down on his knees there at the door and prayed for that young man that God would deliver him from drugs and give him the courage and the confidence to say no to drugs and yes to the Lord. What an example. What an example of an elderly person who most of the time says, well, let the young people do it. I've had my day, but not Hugh Phillips. <laughs> He hadn't had his day because God was not through with him and he was not through being faithful to the Lord. That could be us. We could have a prayer meeting in our house. We could have a, a time of sharing with people who don't know Christ and that one person in that group could come to know Christ, could come into our church and be a part of our church family because we have been faithful to the Lord. It starts, first of all, with knowing Jesus Christ. Before you can carry out the Great Commission, you have to have a changed heart like the disciples. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, then I ask you to come today if you do not have the confidence, you don't have the faith, you don't have the assurance that when you die that you're going to heaven, then will you come today and ask Christ to be your Savior? By coming forward, I will know that you're coming to accept Christ. It may be that you're carrying a heavy burden because of some reason today. If you are, then you come and allow me or Alex to pray for you. I'm going to ask Alex to stand down front with me. We're going to, uh, as the musicians come, we're going to play one stanza. As God speaks to you, you come. And then there will be a second part of our invitation that I'll share with you concerning that. And the musicians will stop playing after one stanza. And then I'll give you the second part of the invitation. May we stand together, please, as we sing together.